Hello, I'm Laura. I'm a librarian in the Information Technology Department here at Mercer County Library System. And today I'm going to be talking to you about Ancestry Library, which is a premier database used for genealogy and family history research. This is part four of a series we're doing on family history research. The first one was a general overview on getting started in genealogy. The second was about resources available at the library. And the third was a overview of our Heritage Quest database. If you've watched that one already, Heritage Quest, as I mentioned in the beginning of that video, is pretty much a watered down version of this particular database that we're going to look at today. Now, Heritage Quest is available to you remotely through the library system. Ancestry Library is not. It can only be used within our uh, buildings. So you would have to visit the library in order to use the Ancestry Library version. Now, Ancestry does indeed have an at-home version that some of you may subscribe to, and you may have turned to this video to get more information on how to search and maximize your results in that particular database. That's perfectly fine. Be aware there are some differences. Since this is a product that we're looking at today that's designed for library users and not a personal use, you won't see things in here like the DNA area or the area to uh, create and update your own family tree. What you will have access to, however, is all of the other uh, database components that are in the at-home version, including message boards, other public member trees, and um, of course all of the resources. So what we're going to look at first is at the top we have the black bar going across the screen where we have different areas in the menu. Um, I'm going to start all the way to the right because these are going from right to left going to be easier to explain and quick and we can uh, just get rid of them quickly here um, first of all you have the new collections area now this is where items that are added to the catalog will be listed and you'll have an idea of what's new so if you come in here frequently and you're just looking for a certain area that maybe you see a, a resource that's been added or updated that you may want to just jump into that specific resource be aware that there are items added on a monthly basis, almost daily, that there's some sort of record update that's going in on this database. So you can see here on the right, we've got a listing of over 10,000 resources, and it's arranged by the date that it was updated. So even though this is what's new, there may be an existing collection and they've been indexing or digitizing portions of a collection at a time. So you may be seeing new records added in uh, even though you may have looked in the resource before and not found something for your particular relative, it may have been added since you last searched. So don't be ignoring a resource that shows up here because you say you've already seen it. A lot of times things are in here because they've been updated. And one way you'll see that is on the activity listing on the right. If it's a new database, it will say new. And if it was an existing one, it will say it's updated. So you'll have an idea of whether or not you know, you're looking at something brand new that you may not have looked at before. You'll also be able to see this pop up if you scroll over the title of the data or the uh, resource that was added in the database. So in this case, it's telling you when it was originally published and when it was recently updated. And then you'll get a little brief blurb about what the resource entails. You'll also see how many records were added and what collection it belongs in. So the number of records you might see a zero like this, that usually means that they've just added the base for this particular resource. And what you're going to be seeing over the next several months will be those records will be added as they're digitized and indexed. The other thing you'll see is how many records those existing databases that were updated. You'll see in many cases there are millions of records. So very few times you'll see anything in the hundred thousands or in the low, you know, 10, 20, or this like uh, Mexican fine degree from the 1800s has 32,000. So usually that's because of just, there's just not a, a large number of items that would normally be in that database. So what you're going to be looking for is mostly the title and you'll see the pop-up. And if this is particular resource of, that's of interest to you, you can click on it and go right into the area that you can search. The next thing over is the charts and forms. This is where you'll find blank sheets that you can click on where it says download form and you'll get a printable PDF that you can then use to fill out 
as you're doing your research. So we have the basic forms like the ancestral chart and the family group chart. There's also some research aids in here as well. So this research extract is what air is a um, blank form where you can put in the information regarding the resource that you've encountered and you can give uh, a little brief description so that if you need to go back to it again you'll have information like what archive you found it in, what the call number or microform number was, and a little bit of a brief description of what kind of resources you might find in there. So you may find something that you think might be useful later down the road, but you're not quite sure where it fits in now. It's a good idea to fill out a research extract uh, form for yourself so you can go back to it when you need to. The next area over is the Learning Center. Uh, this is not learning how to use the database, this is learning how to do the research. So what you're going to find in here is they do have a getting started guide and they do have information about things like how to use the census to access records and of course the beyond the basics, but they also have subject guides. So if you're looking for an immigrant or if you want to use military records or you're looking at a different ethnicity, uh, they're going to have guides to help you find information based on what type of records you're looking at. So for example under immigration it's talking there's an area where it talks about how to use passenger lists. Under the ethnicity there's an African American family research guide. So it's tailored towards getting started and doing the basics but then you get into more detailed how to's in the research guides. There's also maps in here as well so if you needed a map from any of the United States you can go in there and grab a map. One of the strengths I mentioned earlier of Ancestry is its wide grouping of people that are working on their own family histories or that are professional genealogists who are coming in here and using this particular resource. So as we're doing searches, you'll see some family trees that are in here, but you'll also see that there's this message board area. The message board is extremely useful because it's not going to show up when you do a regular search but you do have an option to search under the message boards area. <clears throat> and what you'll find here is if somebody else is doing research, they may have a um, particular question or they may be asking about a particular last name or surname that you're looking for, or there might be a certain area where they're trying to identify resources. So it's always a good idea to come in here and see if somebody else has asked a question that would help you with your research. If they haven't, by all means, you could go ahead and ask a question as well. So, for example, if I go to Canada under the categories and then just look into Ontario, you'll see there's general Ontario research, but then you're going to see different areas or cities in Ontario, villages. Sometimes you'll see surnames in here. So if you go into Toronto, you're going to see here's where the messages are. And there are over 12,000 messages of people researching information in Toronto. And you'll just see a question and then you'll see if there have been any answers. So that's pretty much how you use the message boards. Now the search itself, when you click on that you get a drop down. You can do either everything or you can do a search within a collection. So for example if you're just starting to try and figure out where a relative may have lived and you're looking for just any needle in a haystack. The census and voter lists are pretty good because that's going to do a nationwide search uh, of all the census archives. And you're going to see if you're going to find that relative within either the United States, the United Kingdom, or Canada. And what you'll see as well is you could also search by additional family members. So if you're not sure of the head of household, but you do know what their mother's name was or a sibling or a spouse, you can go and fill that information in as well. So you can be as general or as specific as you want to here. You'll also see there's this option to match all terms exactly. And when you do that, um, what you're going to see is um, you will have a less common spelling of a name might show up. Oops. Or you might see if there's a uh, derivative of the name as well. The other thing to be aware of, especially when dealing with the census information, is the census information is not uh, mechanically digitized. Uh, well, it is mechanically digitized, but it's not me mechanically indexed. 
uh, volunteers actually go through the census when it's released. Each time we come up to a new census, there's a little bit of an embargo time and then an old census will be released. So for example, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2010 when the census was done, shortly thereafter the 1940 census was released. There's usually a 70 year wait on the census. So you're looking at after the 2020 census is released, we'll be looking at the 1950 census will also be released. Um, as I'm sorry, as the, as the 2020 census is collected, the 1950 census will, will be released shortly after. Um, so what we're looking at here is I've done a, a, a search for one name, uh, and I was going to say is the translators for these released census, they may read handwriting incorrectly or they or the handwriting may be so poor that it's difficult to even figure out what was in that particular census record. So you'll see what we have here in the second record is it's looking for the first name but it's not picking up the last name and that was because I didn't put I didn't check off the exact um, so I'm getting both the first name and the last name. It will heavily look for the last name, but not the first, but and, and the first name together. Uh, so you're not going to be getting uh, derivatives that are way off right up top. Uh, but if I look down here on the fourth record, you know I searched for Alonzo Priest and it comes up as Alonzo Twist. Now, what you see when you get the records here is you get a basic info here. Then if I scroll over this view image. <laughs> or, I'm sorry, if you scroll over the title, you'll get all the information of what you're going to find on the sheet if you click on view, view image. So here I can look at this and see is this possibly somebody I'm interested in or is it, you know, somebody I can skip. And even though they've got this twist in here, I just happen to know that this is somebody that I should be looking for. So I'm going to go ahead and view the image. And this is a good example of what I was talking about in terms of, let me find them, uh, the transcription being done. Here, when you go into the image, the person you searched for is going to show up in the yellow bar, and anybody else in their household is going to be in, highlighted in green. So we see Nellie and we see Mary. This is the top line, this yellow line that was coming up as Alonza Twist. And to me, I'm looking at this and it really does look as if this does say Alonzo Priest. So in my mind, uh, this is the record I'm looking for, uh, even though in the index, the name is incorrect. So one thing you wanna do, especially when dealing with the census is of course, go back and make sure that even if the indexed name is not what you're looking for. Don't bypass it if you have other information that could be um, value or could could verify this is the person you're looking for. I just happen to know that this particular person did indeed live in this area of Vermont at this particular point in time, so I was pretty sure that this would probably be a, a misindexed or a mistranslated uh, name in the index. Another thing to note is that when you're looking at the census and voter lists from the main page, you'll see that you can narrow by category. Now, considering that you may have a misspelling in the indexing and you have an idea of where your relative may have lived at a certain time, what you can do is you can look into the census, collections, census collections themselves and browse. So for example, the US federal census, if I wanna go in there, I'm going to get a list underneath of the search box of all the census information that's there. So if I wanted to go into that 1860 census, and note also that you'll get information if it's been updated recently, and you also saw some things that were marked as free. That's uh, going to indicate to you that um, if you were to log on to Ancestry.com outside of this database and you went to the Ancestry.com website at home, you would be able to search these collections for free because the census cannot be one of those things that anybody makes money off of. So even though you don't have a subscription to Ancestry or may not have a subscription to Ancestry, you would be able to re, re, uh, use those resources for free. 
Okay, so again you have search boxes, and this even gives you down to the dwelling number, real estate value, whatever whatever information is in the 1860 census, whatever fields there are, you can usually search those in this particular search box. You'll see these fields therefore change based on which year you're using because the census questions do indeed change from year to year. So for example, in the 1930s there was questions about whether you owned a radio. So that would be one of the things that would be here, owns a radio. What I wanted to point out to you is on the right, you can see a browse area. So again, if I was looking for that particular area of Vermont, I can pick that state and then I can go down to the county. And then once the, okay, that's weird. Should not have happened. Um, I'm just gonna click New Jersey then and hopefully we will get a New Jersey census to come up. Okay, so we picked Lawrence Township out of New Jersey. Um, I have no idea why the Vermont census was not working, but there you have it. Okay, so what we're gonna do is if you come to this through the browsing, you're always gonna start on page one and you're gonna see the full page in um, you know image format. <clears throat> so if you're looking for somebody and it wasn't coming up in the search, but you're pretty sure they lived in this particular area, you can go in here and much like you would be able to use the microfilm, you can go through and look by, you know, pretty much eyeball the uh, lines, line by line. And then you have these arrows on the left and right, which will let you page through the census. You also have a page viewer down here. So if you wanted to jump ahead to a certain page, you could do that. So I'm just going to go back. Come on. <laughs> okay. So I've come back here. And uh, basically that is the information that we had on the census and voter lists. There's also in here the birth, marriage, and death records. So this is where you're going to see any area that has vital records that have been um, Let's do our search for Alonzo Priest. So any vital records that have been digitized will come in here as well. And again, you can put in, if you're looking for the exact name, and you could also do, uh, even just do gender if you wanted to, um, to try and lower the misspellings, but you could also do the location for some or all of them. So I'm going to go ahead and do a search like that. So what I've basically done now is I've gotten a list of records in Vermont that may relate to this particular individual. And usually, again, you can scroll over the title and get a uh, rundown, or you can click View Image, and you'll get, again, a copy of the death certificate. And that's interesting because this particular person did not show up as the individual we're looking at. If we look in line one, it's actually a child. And this particular individual is listed as the father's name. So that's what you're going to see when you're using the vital records search, which is the birth, marriage, and death results. So again, be aware that you're going to see the name re referenced, but it's not going to necessarily mean that the record is about that individual. That individual may be listed on there for another area, and in this case it was the father's name. Okay, the other types of searches and records we have in here, there are military records. And again, you can put in as little or as many much information as you want, and take a look at what we find, and notice that the categories in the military area is pretty wide. And you're gonna be looking at, again, some records that are worldwide, uh, mostly from English speaking countries, but you're going to see things in here such as um, militias in the United Kingdom and Ireland. Uh, you'll also see things such as the draft and enlistment and service records, 
casualty schedules and um, pension records. There are also histories in here. So in certain cases where a branch of the military or a particular company, somebody may have done a history on a company that was in the Civil War, for example, you might find a printed history that has uh, information about your ancestor. Now the inter interesting thing about military records is they tend to be pretty comprehensive. So when you're looking at stuff as, such as the draft information, uh, for example, World War I and World War II in the United States, there are draft cards that each uh, male had to fill out. And there's information on there that, you know, may be not going to indicate so much in terms of genealogy, but is of interest in terms of finding out about the overall health of the individual, because they did have to list health problems. They also used, usually had to list a next of kin, which in many cases was a spouse. So you might find information about a wife or a parent from the draft cards. Uh, the other thing too is if you know somebody served, but you don't know uh, why they, or you might not know information about how they uh, may have been killed in action, you'll have the casualty reports in there as well. Uh, as well as you're going to see the pension records. Pension records in certain areas are really extremely useful. Uh, the Revolutionary War and the Civil War in particular have pension records that if you're looking for a relative, you may find that if they served, they would have received a pension, but then their spouses and you know, any children may be listed on there as well. Not necessarily ch the children all the time. They would possibly be listed if they were minors and it was listing the entire household, but you do usually get uh, records regarding the spouse. So you could check pension records, we'll give you more details about that. But then if you're also just generally researching a relative's uh, military career, that's where you get those informations about the histories where they might see what campaigns they were involved in, uh, what theaters of action they may have seen if they were in a war. And then you'll also get things like any honors or distinctions, medals they may have won. But there's also things like disciplinary actions in there, as you can see. Uh, so there's stuff in there, and there's also photos uh, a lot uh, that will show up with other members of their unit may have posted photos. So again, this is going to be a lot of stuff that's in the uh, U.S., uh, the British colonies, or the, uh, you know, if somebody had served in like the East India Company area uh, for the uh, British government, or you might see Irish records in here as well. So I'm going to do another search here. So you can take a look at what kind of records we have come up. So we're seeing here that you've got uh, different roles, muster roles, especially in the Navy and the Marine Corps, will also kind of let you track where a particular individual may have been uh, when they were doing um, deployments. So you'll see what ship they may have been deployed to, you'll see if they had been in a particular a company where and when and so you'll see that information there and you'll also see things like the pension files now of course I was doing re Vermont research earlier <clears throat> I'll just give you a quick look note that the file number is often a an M number with a roll number that comes from the National Archives and that number is usually a reference to the microfilm role that you would be seeing. So in this particular case, this is giving you information about the individual, but also the uh, source information as well. Also notice that not all items have an image that's been indexed, I mean, uh, that's been uploaded. So while the records may have been digitized for indexing purposes, they may not have been digitized in terms of making the image available to you. So we'll just click on one so you can see what a muster roll looks like. As I mentioned, it usually does have a list of who was on a ship, and it will also give you information, including their service number and where they had enlisted. Where they enlisted is usually, of course, close to where they would have lived. So if you're not sure about where somebody may have been from or where you might have family members, but you've seen somebody on a muster roll, then you have an idea that their place of enlistment may have been close to their home. So for example, if you were looking for this guy, Kurtz, on line 18, you can see he was enlisted in San Francisco. Uh, so you may now not have known you might have had a, a, a relative that lived in California, but it's a good chance he did because why would he travel all the way to California to enlist? He would have probably enlisted somewhere near his house or his home. So 
there you have it as well. And the other thing too I'll mention is keep in mind general American history when you're doing research on um, items such as this. You'll see line 21, Owen Lynch. He is listed as Pearl Harbor TH, that's the territory of Hawaii, because at the time Hawaii was not a state. So do keep in mind certain things uh, where territories, for example, another one is Maine, used to be part of Massachusetts. So if you're looking for research in the, around the Revolutionary War, you're not going to find Maine, but you are going to find Massachusetts. Uh, so those are things that you're going to have to look for uh, as you're doing your research is just to kind of keep a general idea of what was going on in the country in the country's history at the time okay so i'm going to go back talk a little bit more about military records <clears throat> So I'm going to click on the casualties. One thing we'll find is that if you look on some of these, this Burl's death file, that will tell you where somebody has been buried if they've uh, been killed in action and they've been buried overseas. And here's a good example of one. <clears throat> and this was somebody who was killed overseas in the Philippines. And again, if you are paying attention to your history, you'll notice the date of death was October 20th, 1944. This would be when um, <clears throat> MacArthur had returned to the Philippines. So I will go ahead and click on view for this one. And what we'll see here is you get an information about where the it, where which cemetery this particular individual is buried. And um, you even get the exact location of the grave and who has provided the information. So in this next of kin, you now see that this is listed as his brother. So you now know if you had this individual's information and you were looking for other possible um, records regarding him, that you would be able to see that he, or you're looking for relatives, you would be able to see that he did have a brother and where that brother lived. Okay, so going back to the searching area, uh, there is also the immigration and travel. Now the travel, it's kind of interesting. Um, we've been seeing for years passenger lists of individuals coming to this country in terms of immigration. And this area will also keep a list of the uh, citizenship and naturalization records. So you may see some of that information in here, but you'll also see um, the travel information. So as people were crossing back and forth, uh, they may have actually gone to uh, Europe uh, and then come back. You'll see that there will be ship lists, manifests, as well as the border crossing information and also crew lists. So if somebody may not um, show up in something like the census, for example. If they were working as a crewman on one of these ships that was constantly going back and forth, you'll see them listed there, but they may not show up anywhere else. Uh, so that's why the crew lists are being added to the database on a regular basis as well. What's also kind of neat uh, is that when you do find a relative, um, in many cases, there are ship pictures and descriptions. So it's kind of cool if you find your relative and you then look for that ship and you can get an idea of what you know, the ship looked like that brought them over. There might be descriptions about how passengers were treated or what any of the uh, travels across the, front the ocean would have been like. So there are some odd things in here that might not help you in terms of finding an individual in your family history, but that can, but that can help you flesh out the family history and get a better idea of what life was like for them to become an American or, or to, to come to America on one of these ships. And I was going to say is to become an American, there is the citizenship information as well. So I'm going to do a search, <clears throat> and since we're in the immigration area, I'm going to pick somebody I know should have been an immigrant, and we're going to see that in, right off the bat, we have some exact matches. And again, if you scroll over, you're going to see a list of information. Now, from previous research, I do know this is the particular person, the individual I'm looking for. 
And if you click on, I'm, I have been clicking on the image, but I wanted to click on this time on the title. So this is where you'll see that pop up. But the other information here is you're going to get the citation and you're going to get an idea of where that information came from. So again, we had mentioned the uh, microfilm reels that started with M. The National Archives also has a lot of microfilm reels that start with the letter T. So you're seeing this uh, resource here and it's citing a T number, which is a microfilm roll or a collection, and it tells you the exact role to look for, and it also tells you the line number and the page number to look for. Now what's kind of cool here is um, because this is related to a ship, a specific ship, you'll see not only the record information here that you could view, but you can also also view the image of the ship. So there you have it. This is the ship that one of my relatives came over on, and I can go back to my record and I can view the record about that crossing. And the thing with the ship manifests is usually if you come to the top you'll see um, they have information on here about the individual that you of course would be interested in including their age, whether they were married, uh, what occupation they had, but you'll also see that there's usually somebody who has to be listed as somebody who they are coming to this country to visit or be with or live with. Uh, it could be a friend, so it's not always going to be a relative, but if you look over on this one, number 10, 11, and 12 are very helpful if you're doing uh, information or research and you're trying to cross the pond, as they say, and go back to Europe. In this case, number 10 is going to tell you what country and town they've come from. And 11 is going to tell you where they're going in terms of when they've come here, what individual they're going to go see. So you may, again, just be looking at a friend, but you may also see relatives that have come over previously. And it's going to tell you what state and town that final destination is located in. So in addition to just trying to pinpoint exactly when a relative may have come to this country, the manifests are very good in terms of allowing you to find information about where they came from as well. And as I mentioned, this also includes border crossings um, and other kinds of information such as passport uh, applications. So you'll see that in here as well. The other thing too is I haven't mentioned it uh, earlier. We had seen when I was talking about the exactness of the results you're going to get. At the top there is a search filter. So it tells you where on this uh, spectrum from a broad uh, interpretation of that to an exact search. So this is going to give us on the broad side, it would give us an alternative spelling of this with a K instead of a C. Uh, there may other be other uh, um, different names. It's picking up Joseph and Dorothy and John. So if you think that's too broad, you can always just use the slider to sort of narrow it down. And it gives you a little pop-up as you're going. So it's either exact or sounds like or has the same initials. And the middle one is it's exact or sounds similar. And if you go all the way to the right, it is pinpoint exact. Whatever you typed in in your search is all it's going to look for. So if I see that and I do update, you'll see I had 16. I now have only three results. And again, the broadness of the last name has given me one that has a Y at the end instead of an I. Okay, so the last area to search is you can go into the card catalog in general. We saw the new list earlier. That was exactly what we're going to see here. So this is where you want to go if you have an idea of, of the type of resource you're looking for and you want to go in and see if you can just hit, hit that particular resource. So like here, the Oregon State Marriages, you could go in and look for that. You could also do a state search, you know, and uh, see what is available or a country search. So if I do Vermont, I've narrowed my record search down to 30 possible sources and that's just in the title. Now in the keyword I could do Irish and see what I come up with and now I've got 1,491 and as I mentioned this is not just strictly United States records there is a lot in here from Canada and as well as the other English territories such as Ireland and uh, I mean Northern Ireland and of course Ireland being an independent country and the United Kingdom itself and then all the uh, UK um, 
a lot of the UK territories or colonial possessions will also show up in some of the general UK resources. So be aware of that. So again, we see we have a lot of information that comes up from Ireland or that relates to Irish heritage in here just by doing a keyword search. We're going to clear all of that so you can go back and see the whole collection of over 10,000 resources. And again, you're going to see all these different types of things listed. Now, when we were doing the search up here, we didn't see a way to search for family trees or the maps or the school directories. That's because the last search that you can use is the all category search. These collections are usually the ones that people go for immediately because they're looking for a very specific piece of information. The best search to do is actually the all category search. So I'm going to go back to my search for Alonzo Priest. <clears throat> and when I find him, I'm going to see I now have the ability to also filter by those different subcategories. So again, you're going to see on the right a list. Now I have 33,414 records. This is again where I could use that slider and make it more exact. And if I just pick the middle road here, just update it. And I've let, narrowed it down to 624. Now here is a matching record from a family tree. So this is somebody who if I thought was the correct person, which in my case it is not, I could just go in and look at this person's family tree. Now be aware that only people who have asked or allowed their family tree to be shared publicly will show up in this database. Private trees will not. If you do have the at home version and you see somebody has a private tree, it will give you an ability to send a message to the person and ask if you could you know, be added to see their tree or if they could help you out with some research and see if you guys are a match in some way. So this is what a family group sheet would look like for this particular individual, where it's going to give you information about their life and all the uh, key events. And it's going to show any resources that were used. But it's also going to give you the family group sheet here. So you're going to see their parents, any siblings, and then their spouse and children. This private notation usually means that the person is probably still alive and their name has been uh, withheld for privacy reasons. So that's the kind of stuff you would see if you do indeed encounter a family tree. Now of course keep in mind this is someone else's research and you will want to verify any information you just don't want to take it um, for granted that they have found the information and it's correct but it does give you a place to start so if you do look at this and you say oh i didn't know what his father was who, who, who his father was you'll now see the information here you could do research on your own to find out if that's correct so that's why i said the search the general search is going to give you more information because in addition to pinpointed searching like the census the vital records, the military, and the immigration information, you're now getting the rest of the items that are available, the rest of the type of resources that are available in this particular database. The court, land, wills, and financial records. Another area you want to look at is wills and probate. Wills used to be, you know, of course, filed, and they still are, but basically they are public record for the older records. So you look at a will or you look at a probate record, you're going to see not only information about who may have inherited inf uh, that's items from this particular person, but you'll also get a general idea of what their life was like. So if you start seeing uh, large sums of uh, or large value or large amounts of property, you might know that they're well off. You may see a large number of holdings in terms of animals. If they had a farm, uh, that'll also indicate to you uh, their general wealth and lifestyle that was available to them. Um, so you'll see that and then you might see of course in the wills uh, or the probate records that certain things were left to certain children or spouses so that's going to give you more clues about the individual. The other thing is directories and membership lists. They'll show up usually it's a city directory. City directories uh, for those who may be unaware uh, were early directories that were similar to phone books. So while the phone books aren't published anymore, sort of like the white pages online, you will find information 
in there about where people lived. So you could track migration of your family from cities to different states and uh, get an idea of where they lived during certain periods. So it's a good resource, especially for getting in between the census. I mean, the census is only done once every 10 years. Somebody could theoretically move four times or 10 times even in 10 years. So the city directories and the membership lists are very helpful for that. There's usually other directories in there as well. So you may see professional directories or school related directories uh, that are in there. The other thing too is you're seeing stories, memories, and histories. These are usually items that people have uploaded. Uh, so you might see, well in this case it's actually from an actual printed book, but there might be things in here that people have uploaded, family stories, uh, but there's also these printed uh, local history resources in here as well. And once you've found an informa some information, um, or a reference to these, you can go ahead and click on that title and it will take you to that page. Whenever you go into one of these records, much like when we were browsing the census, those left and right arrows that show up will allow you to go through the entire resource. So again, at the bottom we see this is page 5 of 13, so if we wanted to really read the rest of this, maybe we think there's a possibility that another relative may be mentioned in here uh, that we might want to know more about or we figure maybe this is a relative that we do know is ours and we want to know what life was like in that area at that time, uh, you can go back and forth and read the uh, whole resource if you wanted to. So I'm just going to go back. Come on. <laughs> Uh, sorry about this. Okay, so basically that's what you're looking at when you're dealing with the um, social and place histories. Other items that show up underneath of that stories, memories, and histories, as I was mentioning earlier, um, a lot of times there are military organizations that upload photos of their members or uh, people who had served in a particular unit. You'll also see family histories and stories that are published in here as well. Uh, that people have attached items perhaps to their personal family tree and they've made it available to share. So those might be in there as well. So basically that is how to use Ancestry Library. Uh, as I mentioned, this was part four of a series. I actually just realized there was a quick link that I did not show up in there. A um, couple of things. Uh, there is the newspaper obituary area that you'll find in here and then items such as um, the school directories and everything, those come up in that directory uh, thing that we were looking at. And so I just wanted to make sure you knew the obituaries, obituaries are in here as well. So if something is published as an obituary, uh, there's also pictures in here. I mentioned earlier some people upload photos, whether as part of an organization or a group that is doing an, uh, maybe an alumni thing or a uh, military reunion kind of uh, organization and as well as individuals. So those two resources will show up. The searches I did did not have results that were in those areas, but they are in here as well. Uh, so anyway, I was gonna say this is, as I mentioned earlier, part four of a series that we're doing on the family history. So if you are in the midst of doing your family history or just getting started, be on lookout for further uh, videos as part of this series. Uh, good luck doing your family history.